and welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager. I am pleased today to have as my guest host, Haley Ringle joining us again. Welcome to the show, Haley. Thank you. And we have Villanelle. And Villanelle is also on the show because she loves to be the star of attention, I think so. <laughs> and Haley, for those who don't remember, is my best friend from Phoenix, Arizona, joining us uh, again via Zoom as we do Real Film Snobs these days. And so we're going to be talking about some new movies out in theaters and on streaming this week. Um, so we're going to kick it off with our new, our first film, which is Windfall by director Charlie McDowell. It is about a man who breaks into a tech billionaire's home but things go awfully awry when the man and his wife unexpectedly show up. Um, and the reason I'm saying things like man and man is because none of the characters in this movie have uh, character names. So the, uh, the, the man who breaks into the house, uh, who is billed in the film just as nobody on the credits on IMDb, uh, is Jason Segal and the tech billionaire and his wife are played by Jesse Plemons and Lily Collins. That's pretty much the entire cast. It's a, you know, it's one of these kind of little pot boilers with a really small cast. I think they probably shot it during COVID and we're trying to think of ways to like, you know, make a film in a in a fairly confined space with a small cast. Um, what's really interesting about this film is that it goes in a lot of different directions that you may not be expecting. It's definitely, it's a sort of a thriller, but it's also a little bit of a character study. A lot of the first half of the film is really setting up these characters and their interactions one another as we sort of gradually unveil layers, including the many, many problems in the marriage between uh, the Jesse Plemons and Lily Collins characters. This film was directed by Charlie McDowell, who I looked up and he'd previously directed a film I really liked called The One I Love with Elizabeth Moss and Mark Duplass, was, which was also a very, very weird, kind of like very um, insulated thriller um, that, I, that I really admired. Um, I liked this film, especially the first half, but I actually had some some issues with the way the second half went. Um, there's an introduction of a, a fourth character that comes in suddenly and I didn't love what ends up happening with that character. I felt it, it just didn't work for me. And um, I thought Jason Segal and Jesse Plemons were really good, um, really well cast. I'm not a huge Lily Collins fan. And I just, I couldn't help but think, especially when I saw that he previously worked with Elizabeth Moss, how much better this movie would have been with a, a little bit of a stronger actress uh, in the lead, especially since as the second half starts to unveil that her character is actually the most important one. I'm curious to hear what you thought, Haley. I thought it was good. I got. It. I thought it was a good character study. Um, I did watch it with my husband, and he did not like it. He thought it was very boring. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is on Netflix. So, and I definitely thought that too with the COVID. I'm like, oh, this must be another film, uh, film during COVID because there's like no characters and it's all set in the house. They don't leave anywhere. So, um, it seemed like a safe, you know, kind of COVID film. Um, so I think either you see. Um, you know, with some another film we're talking about where everyone's wearing masks, you know, where it's obvious it's filmed during COVID or we're like, oh, with limited characters and li limited settings, we're like, oh, this must be filmed, you know, during COVID. So, but I liked it. Um, I kind of saw it as more with the second half that something needed to happen in order for things to escalate because mm -hmm. they're kind of just kind of going on, you know, and so I feel like that's why they added the fourth character because something you know, needed to happen, you know? Right. And it just was sort of unfortunate that it had to be that character. It kind of, it made me a little uncomfortable, which maybe was also pointed because there is obviously some class issues going on here. There's a billionaire and then a guy that we never quite find out exactly what his issue is, but we think he's probably got a beef with, with this tech billionaire in some way. Maybe he was, we never find out for sure, but maybe he was laid off. He no, lost I his job. I, when, they, when they sat down, he kind of said, you know, that, yeah, I thought that, yeah, was, that he had a history oh, with that. Yeah. So, um, and then she's got her own kind of, you know, story going on as well. Um, you know, and again, maybe it's just my bias, but I just couldn't, uh, the director's married to Lily Collins in real life. And I don't know if that, you know, weighed into him his decision to cast her, but I just would have liked to seen a little bit of a more interesting actress in the lead. She's just never been one that really grabs my attention, especially when you have, I thought pretty powerful performances by Jason Segal and Jesse Plemons um, at the center. Jesse Plemons' character, I mean, you can tell he really digs in. His character is just a total jerk. I mean, you there is nothing likable about his character at all. So, um, so it's and the house is gorgeous. It's I mean, it's a billionaire's vacation home out in kind of a de you know. I'm assuming I'm not exactly sure where they're supposed to be. I was not sure if it was the Southwest or California, like, but yeah, maybe like I don't know Utah or. 
Um, I don't know. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't clear. They did that on purpose again because they had the big sprawling property with no one around because he's again this big gated kind of house. They had the whole exterior to kind of explore while the characters are walking and talking. But, but yeah, I can give it three stars. I just was a little disappointed. I thought it could have, I thought the second half could have been a lot stronger. Um, and I definitely feel like this director, he's definitely got a thing. Like, if, I really encourage people to check out the one I love with Elizabeth Moss and Mark Duplass, which is a, actually an interesting also a film about a couple that um they kind of go on a vacation and things start to go awry but it's um also with a very small cast as well so um not yeah, thought, during covid before covid <laughs> i thought jesse clements was really funny because i like that sarcastic like kind of putting people down humor <laughs> like my husband always makes fun of me he's like well you like that when people make fun of other people in front of them you know i'm like i thought that was funny um, but I kind of saw the the movie as, you know, kind of a, about women who are stuck in a situation that they got into and then they realize this isn't what I want. And so they right. need something like in the movie to happen in order for them to make a change in their life. So that's kind of what I saw it as, as you know, there are a lot of women in situations where they married someone or, you know, you know, and they're just like, they're stuck and they need right. to happen in order for them to move on and so that's how I saw it yeah although she you know someone might say she took some extreme measures to, well, to yeah. move on you know she could have just done the old standard <laughs> divorce you know <laughs> just doing that yeah <laughs> to get out of but it is a movie so they needed to make it thrilling so yeah but definitely for people looking for a good little pot boiler film I mean pot boiler might be you know it is like a, your, you know, like your husband didn't love it because of the probably slowness. I would say it's it's a slow, steady build, um, more, rather than an action type of pot boiler. So, but it's uh, it's a shorter movie. So if you're just looking for, a, you know, kind of yeah, a it's, and it was the right length. I don't think we wanted to sit in that house with those characters for two and a half hours. You know, so it was nice that it was a shorter film. I think so. Yeah. yeah definitely. Okay, ready to move okay. on. Yeah, so the next movie is Turning Red, which is the new Disney Pixar film on Disney Plus. And it was directed by, I think you pronounce it, Domi Shi, who tells the story of Mei Lin, uh, a Chinese Canadian 13 year old battling the ups and downs of the early 2000s with her friends, trying to please her mom, who was played by or voiced by Sandra O, oh, who I love, and uh, crushing on her favorite boy band. Uh, oh, and she turns into a red panda bear when she's upset. So uh, this is obviously a coming of age story um, that breaks some barriers in the industry. Um, the director is Pixar's first solo female director and it's the first Asian led film by the studio. And so that was really cool. Um, it's also about the awkwardness of growing up, something every kid deals with. So I feel like um, I've talked to some parents about this movie and they're like, well, you know, we have to have a conversation, you know, if you watch this with, with my kids. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, there's also some, uh, you know, stories out about how this isn't a kid's movie, which I think is funny because obviously every animated movie is, um, sorry, those are my cats driving me crazy. Um, every animated movie is made by adults. So I feel like every animated movie has some aspects where people are like, is this really a kid's movie? You know? Well, so, and Pixar in particular is kind of known for that. I mean, they take on serious issues in a lot of their movies. Yeah. I mean, you know, death and, you know, I think that's, but I, I feel like this is something that every, you know, uh, obviously it's directed towards girls because, uh, you know, she, you know, is going into puberty, but obviously boys have this too. And I love the whole boy band thing because this, you know, I was in a boy band when I was younger and, um, you know, it kind of uh, reminded me of, you know, me wanting to see Nirvana and my family, you know, my parents didn't want me to go see it. So I feel like there's something that there's always like maybe a concert or something that your parents don't want you to do. And you're like, I'm going to do everything possible to do it, you know, right, I right. Would, would have snuck out of the house to see Nirvana, you know, but my parents were like, you can see them next time. And obviously, yeah. You know. That didn't happen. Yeah. And no. you still remember that and regret it. Oh, if you'd wait, only yeah. been like Mei Lin and rebelled. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, no, and that's the funny thing about it because so much of some of the criticism of the movie was saying, oh, it's too specific. People can't identify with it. I, I think that's just the usual guarded sexism and racism coming out, honestly, because Pixar has always dealt with difficult themes of, of, of you know, death and racism and, you know, all identity issues. I mean, uh, depression. Um, these are all themes that have come up in their earlier films. I take on very serious topics. And, you know, puberty, uh, which is what, you know, really this film is about in a lot of ways and kind of that period where you're trying to find yourself and, you know, uh, maybe separate yourself from your family a little bit, but also, um, you know, become your own person is a really, you know, it's something that everybody goes through, boys, girls, um, you know, any anybody of, um, it goes through that period in life. Obviously, this one's more specific to girls, which I also found very refreshing because I don't feel like girls puberty is very explored very much. Um, and so when she turns into a panda, there's definitely, you know, that's the, that's the, the key there. That's the analogy for, you know, something's happening and her body is out of control and she doesn't understand what's going on. And, you know, the, the, the key is that first time it happens, you know, she's like drawing photos of this boy that she kind of likes and this is when it happens. So, you know, there's definitely some sexually charged themes there, but it, it's handled very delicately. I think there's nothing inappropriate that you couldn't show your kids. And the fact that anyone's even having discussion about that is just because of today's kind of climate. There's way um, more insidiary stuff in, you know, old Judy Bloom books, for instance, in the 80s, you know, so. Um, and I loved the, 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 her friends, you know, the friend group that she has and the way they were portrayed. They each had their unique personalities and they all kind of, you know, they were, they were kind of their own tribe together. You know, they were like, we're here for you no matter what, you know, even when she turns into the panda and everyone else is freaked out by her, her friends stand by her and I really loved that and I think anyone with um, controlling parents I'm sure you can't identify that with that at all Haley um, could uh, relate with this film because and in this case you know her parents are really loving but her her dad is kind of checked out a little bit I mean he's just you know he's not He's loving too, but he kind of lets the mother, you know, rule over her and her mother's just very, very strict. She doesn't want her to listen to pop music. She doesn't want her to hang out with weird friends. You know, her mother's just a very strict mother and, you know, that could be cultural, but I think there's a lot of people out there that were raised by strict parents who could probably identify with this. So. And I thought the music was great. You know, the songs are written by Billie Eilish and Phineas. And so obviously it's very current, you know, she's probably one of the hottest, you know, singers around right now. And obviously, you know, her and her brother, um, you know, he was also in the boy band. And, you know, we had boy bands when we were younger, but now we have BTS, who's ridiculously popular, you know, a friend of mine. Oh, I there's been boy bands since the 50s, since pop oh, yeah. started. But, yeah. So you know, it's just a teenage girl or teenage or young person, you know, right. I know you were more into the boy bands than I, I was. I remember we went to Color Me by Odd together. Yeah. That was one of our first concerts. We've just disclosed that on to the whole world now. <laughs> Paula yeah. Abdul and Color Me Bed. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking more of like New Kids on the Block. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. You know, that was probably my first boy band. But Backstreet there was, Boys. You know, Menudo. You know, that was a really popular boy band when we were younger, um, you know, for the Hispanic crowd. So, but yeah, yeah. I really like this film. I thought, you know, the one thing I didn't like, um, I did like the um, animation, but I thought, the mouths were kind of weird. They had really big mouths, mm -hmm. you know, so that was a little, um, it was a little weird, but other than that, I really liked the film. Um, the director also directed uh, Bao, which is the first short film at Pixar to be directed by a woman. And yeah, she, which yeah. is also really good. I like Bao. She also worked in the animation department of Inside Out and Incredibles too. So, you know, both of those are really good movies. So yeah, definitely um, a good one. I think, um, and I just continue to admire the work Pixar tries to do that they're trying to make, you know, films where they're just not there for just entertainment, although it does entertain, but have some themes to address what people, young people are going through. Yeah, so. and I'm a big Disney fan. I was like, ooh, I can't wait to see, you know, the panda, you know, that's definitely every kid's gonna want that panda, you know, character. And I'm like, what, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, what uh, theme park ride can they make out of this? You know, so I was like, obviously thinking of like how they're going to incorporate it into the parks. So, well, I guess you'll find out on your next Disney trip. But we'll see if it's a big enough hit for them to do that. I don't think they even released this in theaters, or maybe they did limited, no, but which is too bad. Disney Plus, yeah, yeah, that's too bad if they don't continue to release Pixar movies in theaters. I hope they do. Yeah. So, 
we're really switching uh, with our next film. So go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be quite a shift. So this next movie is called Bad Luck Banging or Looney Porn. Um, it's a Romanian movie. And I know, Angela, you kind of warned me about this movie, but I ended up seeing the censored version, which is on Hulu. And I had no it's idea. Censored? It's completely censored. So. Oh, okay. I see what you, what you said. You know, Angela was like, just to warn you, there's, there's actual sex at the beginning. And I'm like, okay, I think I can handle it. And then like, it starts and there's a big box with like funny sayings on every single sex scene. So they, you could hear it but you could not see anything. Oh, okay. Well, the version I watched, <laughs> um, so was part of a streaming through a film festival last year yeah. and it was um, not censored because that's not yeah. the way the film was intended yeah. to be shown. And it just starts, so I will <laughs> warn you, unlike uh, Turning Red, which some parents are like, this is too much for kids and I don't agree. This is too much for, you do not show your, your especially if you manage to get your hand on the uncensored version, apparently. I did not know Hulu was showing the censored version of this film. So yeah, that would make a huge true. difference. Cause when I first opened it and I started watching it, my husband walked in and I was like, what are you watching? <laughs> he, thought, he thought I was watching. I was like, it's a Romanian film and it's totally, it's on critics list. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, so let me tell you a little. So this is a Romanian film about a middle school history teacher who finds herself under intense scrutiny after her sex tape with her husband is leaked on the internet for everyone to see, including her students and their parents who are not too happy. Um, it's set into, I kind of call it an amateur Romanian version of the Pam and Tommy sex tape scandal. <laughs> which I know it's not the same thing, but you know, you have to kind of make it uh, interesting for people to want to watch it. So uh, the film was set in three parts. Um, the first part is her kind of walking around town and they're showing, you know, scenes of like buildings and, you know, it's very meandering. Um, and then the second part is a, a slideshow of various components of Romanian history and culture. Um, you know, it's kind of like a you know, like a history, you know, it's just kind of odd, you know, just like random, you know, things. And then the third part is her at the meeting with, with uh, this, the parents trying to defend herself and try, you know, try to keep her job. And so it's definitely a weird movie. Um, and, you know, even, you know, obviously I didn't, since it was all censored during the censored portion, since you didn't see that, Angela, they have different sayings, um, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, you can show a killing, but not a blowjob, you know, and different uh, sayings like that, um, you know, along with it. So uh, that was interesting. Um, I thought it was very tedious. Um, I think you could have cut out the, the second part. And even the first part, I was just like, what does this, all this mean? You know, so. Oh, I loved it. I love this film. I disagree. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. I mean, so. I thought what he was pointing to, I mean, it's obviously helpful if you know anything about Romanian history, which I don't necessarily know, but he gets into that in the second chunk, you know, the Romanians have this, you know, very patriarchal, very conservative culture. And, you know, in some ways you could align things going on in the US today over the body politic, over women's bodies and, and you know, all the stuff we're going on with our culture wars in this country right now. And I think he's pointing at the beginning, she's sort of walking around meandering, but he's showing you what's going on in Romania today. So you see like, just some craziness. For one thing, I was noticing nobody is wearing their masks in the middle of COVID in Romania either, which I know they had really high COVID rates because of lack of mask compliance. But she, you also see her walking around and getting into, there's altercations. There's a guy that just gets angry at her because she's walking on the sidewalk and he's pulling up and just parking on the sidewalk. And then he starts calling her horrible names. Well, but she, think, she confronts him and says, you need to get off the sidewalk or I'm going to call the police. So it's right. not like she's walking, she's confronting. No, but he no. his response is pretty inappropriate, okay. I think. And yeah. so I think they're showing all this anger building up by especially, you know, you noticed it's a lot of times these middle aged dudes who are just like angry and yelling at everybody in the movie at the beginning. And I was like, wow, this looks I mean, it was almost a little disturbing because I'm watching another country, a whole other culture in a way, and then finding all these similarities to what's going on. And then they get into the Romanian history section. Um, which, of course, you know, Romania had some of the most famous, you know, anti-abortion laws and um, issues with over its in its previous dictatorship when it was controlled by the Soviets. And then the third section with the different families um, coming together at the school to confront her just shows all this hypocrisy and all these different people and their points of view. Everyone from like the right wing military guy who's yelling at her about 
you know, his perspective, some of the women who are like, you know, how dare you do this, even with your husband, and one guy who's saying, you know, you're essentially a whore for doing these types of acts. And I mean, they're getting into all these different issues, and then other people who have different perspectives, but um, all of it comes down to, in a way, the fact that the, the culture is regressing so rapidly. That's what I took out of it. And he's making humor out of it. This director is known for making his, his, one of his previous films I saw was called, I do not care if we go down in history as barbarians. And so a lot of his films are comments on Romanian culture and society and, um, and particularly how, you know, some of the kind of like right wing or fascist elements are, are, are affecting culture there. So I think, I think it's definitely very specific, though not everyone will love this movie, that's for sure. Uh, and, and showing the real sex at the beginning does have an impact. It's interesting that they censored it because, you know, it's very like in your face. But then when you find out later, it's just a woman making love to her husband and they were just having fun. You know, why they filmed it, that's a whole other thing. But yeah, it's just. Well, yeah. And maybe since I saw the censored version, I just, I'm, you know. I'm like, I, I feel like, you know, I'm an adult, I could see, you know, and so that's why, you know, I, I think it was a different movie than what I, than what you saw. So, right. right. I'm really I'm surprised really that, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that they censored it because it is really explicit, but it isn't the first film, like feature film to use real sex. I mean, the French have done it in some of their feature films as well. And it's, it's pointed for a reason at the beginning and it's only the very beginning. There's no real sex throughout the film. It's just the beginning. It's just right there. But yeah, this was one that, you know, I only knew about because it made quite a few critics lists and I was curious about it. And I'd seen some of this director's other films and I found his stuff to be very interesting. And some of it is humorous. I mean, it's over the top, like the characters at the end with the parents, they're not supposed to be realistic. It's each one is sort of like an archetype of a type of person in Romania, because you have like the military guy, the uptight woman, you had, um, I, I think there's a clergy member even in there. I mean, it's just sort of like random, the people that they have, but it, it seems like it's specific. It's not supposed to be a realistic film, I think. So, yeah. So I think obviously I liked it more than you did. <laughs> yeah. So and anyway, I, we'll move. I would like to see the uncensored version to really. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Them. And I hope that they release that somewhere um, eventually, probably not on Hulu, which is owned by Disney. So they probably don't want to put that on their, <laughs> their network. So we'll move on to our next movie, which is Big Bug. Um, another movie also that w debuted on Netflix by uh, Jean-Pierre Jeannot, who I've not seen a film from in a while. And so I was really excited to see this because I'm a big fan of his earlier works, particularly The City of Lost Children, which I think is a classic. Uh, most people People know him from Amelie, but City of Lost Children, I think, is his best film. Um, so this is about a group of kind of bickering people out in this house in the suburbs who all of a sudden become locked in their home or in the, the one, one of the characters' homes um, during an android uprising. They're locked in the house uh, by their well-meaning household robots who are trying to lock them in to protect them from the uprising. Um, and while they're all locked in, in this tightly confined space, again, back to the tightly confined space uh, issue, um, everything you can imagine starts to go awry. The main characters, it's the woman who owns the house who's considered, it's funny, she's kind of called a Luddite because she's still into books and physical things, but of course she still has robots in her house and her house seems very high tech to us. You know, it's a futuristic movie. So uh, her ex-husband and his kind of trophy girlfriend slash wife, um, her uh, her child and then her this guy who was visiting with her who's her potential love interest and his teenager so I, did I get all the main characters I think so and you have anyway, oh and the neighbor and then there's the nosy neighbor who came by just to see what was going on and then gets locked in the house with them so it's this kind of like eclectic it's very Jean-Pierre Genou in that it's art directed fantastically like if you just like to look at a movie that's just good looking I would recommend this one because I loved the set design and the way he portrayed all the things going on inside the house and the robots or the androids in the house all have these very distinct personalities which were also very humorous yeah. um to me, the movie is definitely not up to the standards of his best films because it just kind of feels like it peters out eventually, like he didn't really have good ideas of where he wanted the story to go. And so it felt a little disappointing from the setup. Um, it's very much on the, and I would say it's quite a bit lighter than something like City of Lost Children, for sure. Uh, doesn't have that kind of weight to it that his previous films did. So what did you think, Haley? Yeah, I thought it was great. I thought Thought it had great characters. I love sci-fi and it was interesting. Um, you know, they had, they were living in this very high-tech um, house, but they loved all things old school, like books and 
um, you know, cameras and, you know, just things that we have now that, you know, they, they just had filled the house with all this cool stuff. And it was also interesting that they weren't allowed to have some of these things, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I thought it was really inventive. I thought one of the weird things about it was, you know, this is a French director. The movie was in English, but it seemed like, um, you know, the, the, um, their mouths didn't match up to a lot of the words. So I didn't know if I was like watching a dubbed version or my you know. version was French. Oh, so I was watching a dubbed version. Did you just watch it on Netflix? Yeah, I watched it on Netflix. So did so, I. Yeah, I'm weird. <laughs> you're yeah, I you're having a technology Netflix. fail yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't even I wonder if you could select it. it. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if there was an option to select dubbed versus French. Yeah, and I was maybe it just I'm like this is a French director, and I'm like, and it didn't seem like any of. So that obviously makes sense. So yeah, yeah, I watched a dub version. So for people who don't like subtitles, there is a dub version on Netflix. So, um, but here yeah. on Real Film Snobs, we endorse the sub, the, the real version, the original Honestly, version. I would have watched it, but it just, it didn't give me the option. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this is another movie I was like, oh, is this filmed during COVID? Because there's basically one scene, they're all scene. in the house. You know, they're so all in the house. Fall. And I think it was people, um, you know, so I thought it was fun. It definitely wasn't the best film, but it was mm -hmm. definitely odd. Um, you know, I love all the robots and kind of all these little side stories, you know, it was very like sexual, you know, everyone was trying to go off and like have fun and then they couldn't, you know, because yeah. of the people in the house, right. Um, you know, so. it fits with his style. I just was disappointed that it didn't you know, it, it felt a little light to me and not in a good way. Not like, oh, I'm just making a cheeky comedy. It just felt like it should have gone somewhere it didn't. And um, uh, the second, again, another movie where the second half to me felt like the first half, there's a lot of promise, I think, with the Android. And also the the COVID aspect is is fun, you know. I mean, it's not fun, but it's, you know, this idea of sticking all these people together. But um, because so many of the characters in this are fairly annoying or and or strong personalities, after a while, I was like, I hope they get out of this house soon because I'm they're starting to drive me crazy. So, And even though it was filmed in the future, they did have a pandemic. So it was like in real time. Right, you know, right. It was set in you know, 2022. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I think, of course, there's a message there of not becoming too reliant on your technology. Uh, but then he kind of undercuts his own message by making like the household robots kind of the heroes in some way at some point. So I was like a little bit like, well, what, what's going on here? So I don't know. It just, it felt like it could have been better, but I'm just, I was excited that he's making movies again. Cause I can't, I, you know, I know he made one movie, I think since Amelie, but not much. So anyway, I was excited. So I know we need to wrap it up, but um, I think, let's see, what can we recommend? I think we can both recommend Windfall. Uh, we both highly recommend Turning Red. I think that's probably our highest recommendation. We split on Bad Luck Banging. I say I recommended it and you're not so much maybe um you know it was odd you have to really yeah. <laughs> and big bug we can mildly recommend so thank you again Haley for being on the show as always you can go to our website Twitter Facebook hit that subscribe bell on YouTube like to thank our crew uh, in absentia but especially Brad Wortman for always taping us our wonderful sponsors Hey, we have a podcast now, so you can just listen to us on our podcast. We're on CC Media Salem, Scan TV in Silverton, Corvallis Access Media, KMUZ Radio, and KMWV Radio. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and great movies. Bye. <laughs>